So good day. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope you are well and safe and welcome to the sessions on territory. This spring, we are with you once again addressing the notion of agriculture, urbanism in the countryside. So this lecture program is curated and organized at the ETH Zurich Department of Architecture for all of you who are joining from other uh, places, even continents. Uh, we are at uh, Architecture of Territory and with us are collaborators of the Institute of Landscape and Urban Studies. I would like to thank and introduce my co-curators, Nitin Batla, um, coordinator of the doctoral program. You can maybe raise your hand. Uh, Nazli Tumerdem and Hans Hortig, researchers at the Institute. And I would like to thank Ayman Heyen for the recording and technical support. A very special welcome to the new class of master in urban and territorial design who started at ETH last week. Welcome to Zurich guys. And also very well welcome to the speakers and guests this afternoon, Raj Patil joining from downtown Austin, <laughs> Texas. <laughs> Uh, and Debiani, Bhattacharya, and Christian Schmidt, uh, the respondents, uh, a fabulous trio, and they will all be introduced in a moment. So uh, what concerns us in this program, I will just say a few words on what we have been doing in this lecture series. We've been discussing future of urbanism, let's say practices of urban design, territorial design, and research. We started five years ago uh, in this uh, format together with Mark Angelil. And the question that we put forward was if our discipline is to keep its relevance in education, in design practice, and in public sphere, what should be its characteristics and what should we work towards? And under urbanism, we uh, understand, in fact, uh, a large uh, range of interconnected fields, uh, urban and landscape design, territorial design, uh, uh, and research, and also various special practices, including activism and the arts. We also understand urbanism in its extended geography, which involves broadening of perspective from, let's say, city-centric focus toward the wider territories and uh, indeed planet as a whole. And I will just give you a very uh, brief uh, uh, idea of, uh, of some of uh, the, uh, the last, I, uh, I hope this is okay. So uh, when we started in the fall of 2017, uh, we looked at uh, urbanism beyond neoliberalism, who has the power to influence urban environments, who has the power to shape them, what is the role of architects in these constellations. Um, we also, uh, a year later, launched the sessions in relation to the notions of Anthropocene and ecology. Um, with uh, many guests, including uh, Jason Moore, for example, discussing how urban and territorial design respond to the urgency of social and ecological transitions. And we also turned attention to all pervasive technologies, arguing the crucial role of design beyond technological solutionism. And last year, we also debated the urban and urbanism in relation to material metabolisms and material accumulations. And finally, <clears throat> we are happy to be back in the seventh iteration of the sessions. What lies ahead uh, in this spring are six, uh, I think, uh, uh, really brilliant events. Thanks, thanks to the speakers, Raj Patel, Lenora Ditzler, Tamar Novik, Christopher Roth, Sakia uh, Art Collective, and Maya and Ruben Fox. We will look at agriculture, the kind of a backside, the difficult antinomy of the urban and the cities. And we will argue 
for a relationship of care and reciprocity with soil and biodiversity, trying to help move beyond intensive industrial models towards agroecological and regenerative land practices. So I wish you a great time and uh, with pleasure, I hand over to Nitin Batla, my co-curator, to tell you a few more words on this year's framing. Thanks, Milica. So as Milica said already, uh, Sessions on Territory is a series of public debates um, on the political economy of architecture and territory. And uh, this year we are focusing on agriculture and the series, therefore, it draws upon relationships of care and reciprocity uh, with soil and biodiversity from the past and present um, to help move beyond consumerist technofixes and towards more self-sufficient and ecological land practices. So through a series of debates um, of, of which today's uh, debate is a part of um, with invited guests, the seminar will explore critical agrarian questions under the emerging agrarian, uh, extended urbanization. Every intervention by a guest speaker is followed by a panel discussion with invited respondents. Um, something worth mentioning here is uh, I'm um, organizing a theory seminar with uh, Professor Christian Schmidt, who's a respondent today, which explores um, agrarian questions under extended urbanization in a greater detail. If any of you are interested in participating in that, please uh, send me a direct message in the chat and I can share the details with you. Um, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll sort of pass, pass on the ball to my, uh, my colleague, uh, Nasli Tumutem, who will introduce um, the a great uh, set of speakers and respondents today. Welcome everyone and uh, welcome also to our first lectures of the sessions on territory. Today we are really delighted to have Raj Patel here with us, who is an award-winning author, filmmaker and academic. He is a research professor in the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. He has degrees from the University of Oxford, the London School of Economics and Cornell University. He co-taught the 2014 edible education class at UC Berkeley with Michael Pollan. And he has worked for and also protested against the World Bank and the World Trade Organization. Furthermore, he has testified about the causes of the global food crisis to the US, UK and the EU governments and is a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. In addition to scholarly publications in economics, philosophy, politics, and public health journals, he regularly writes for The Guardian and has contributed to revered newspapers across the world. His first book was Stuffed and Starved, The Hidden Battle for the World Food System. His second, The Value of Nothing, was a New York Times and international bestseller. He is the co-author with Jason Moore of A History of the World in Seven Cheap Things, whose introduction was also the recommended reading for today. His acclaimed latest book, co-authored with Rupa Maria, is entitled In Flame, Deep Medicine and the Anatomy of Injustice. Raj's first film, co-directed with Zach Piper and filmed over the course of a decade in Malawi and the United States, is the award-winning documentary The Ants and the Grasshopper. He can be heard co-hosting the Food Politics podcast, The Secret Ingredient with Tom Philpot and Rebecca McInroy. We are very excited to hear his lecture entitled When, Where and With Whom is the Anthropocene? And after Raj's lecture, we will have a panel discussion with two amazing guests. Our first one, Debjani Bhattacharya, has been recently appointed as professor at the University of Zurich Department of History for the newly designated Chair of History of the Anthropocene, the only chair of its kind in Europe. Her work explores the legal and environmental history of South Asia and beyond. And last but certainly not least is our second guest, Christian Schmidt, a geographer, sociologist, and urban researcher. He has been active as a video activist, cultural event organizer, and urban researcher since 1980. He has been a lecturer in sociology since 2001, and a titular professor since 2009 at ETH Surrey Faculty of Architecture. On behalf of our team, I can say that we are very pleased to have our lecture guests and participants here today and look very much forward to the talk and discussion afterwards. And now I'm leaving the floor to Raj Patel. Thank you. 
My goodness. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I am just trying to stop sharing. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And so of course, much. the, the ahead, lesson sorry. today is that we should share more. Uh, and uh, uh, but th thank you very much indeed for having me here. I, you know, honestly, I, I feel like an imposter uh, in uh, an architecture school. I mean, the only thing I know about architecture really is that no matter how hard I try, I'm always less stylish uh, than everyone who does architecture. Uh, and there's just no cure for that, I'm afraid. Uh, but what, what I am excited about is uh, this invitation. Uh, I'm very grateful to the organizers for extending it uh, and for your indulgence as I try and sort of muddle through some ideas that were provoked by the idea of the countryside uh, and also some work that I'm doing uh, around world ecology and the idea of land. Um, so maybe I can just sort of kick off uh, and I, I'm, I imagine I'll talk for about 40 minutes, uh, no more than that. Uh, and I'm going to whiz through a whole bunch of things so that we can get into the discussion, which I know is going to be very exciting given the, the range of people who are on this call. So thank you very much indeed uh, for, for being here today. So let, let's let's sort of kick it off. Um, it's PowerPoint time. Uh, am I? Are you able to see the uh, just the, the slide and nothing else? Excellent, terrific. Um, so I, I want to begin with this the, the troubling idea of the countryside, um, uh, and in particular, uh, look, th there's this terrific fresco uh, in Siena, in the Palazzo Publico. Uh, and it's the allegory of good and bad government. It's painted over, uh, over a year and a bit uh, by Lorenzetti. And uh, the, the way it's set up uh, is that you've got your sort of, your, uh, I mean, this is, this is a, a, a hall in which governance is practiced. And looking down on those, uh, you know, those representatives who are practicing government uh, are uh, allegories uh, on the one hand of you know when things are going right in the in the city the effect of good government in the city uh is part of one long wall uh and you can see that the city then extends uh you you can see here uh, th there's there's a city wall and then the countryside is over here uh and it is being well governed um and you can tell that because the crops are fine and there are nice neat rows of everything and uh the you know the buildings are largely intact and there are there's the odd church uh and uh, in general the peasants are being well behaved um, but uh, on the opposite wall, if there is, for example, a tyrant, and you can see the tyrant here with tusks coming out uh, of his head uh, and it, uh, avarice all around him and evil angels, uh, then you will see that the effects in the countryside are dire. Um, and, you know, the, the churches have been hollowed out. This is a bombed out landscape uh, and images like this uh, of uh, an eviscerated countryside are ones that you, you know, you're familiar with. Um, they've been used as alibis for certain kinds of exercises of power in urban areas, um, from the, you know, the licensing of a border patrol to, uh, you know, the, the, the you know, images of this uh, have also licensed the use of pesticides, the use of, uh, you know, patrols to uh, eradicate invasive species, all, uh, and of course, you know, uh, the invitations to war, uh, because of the, the, the sort of dialectics of urban and rural governance, uh, and, and that's the big idea here: uh, is that you know, the, the, you know, the, the, this idea of the countryside only makes sense in dialectical relation with the uh, with the city, uh, and um, that idea, I think, is where I want to spend some time today, and in particular, thinking about the idea of the frontier uh, and the, the sorts of dialectics that that invokes. Uh, so for those of you who uh, haven't yet gotten around to the reading, um, I, I want to spend a little bit of time just sort of giving you the, the abbreviated version of the work of uh, frontiers uh, under capitalism. Um, and we're going to use that to sort of explore what the countryside might mean and the dialectics of power that are involved in its construction. Um, so, uh, but but the frontier, just bear in mind, is, is an idea that we'll be coming back to again and again because it is uh, the site of capitalism. It is the way that capitalism uh, emerges uh, through you know through, through the, uh, the 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 long fifteenth century. Um, so. Uh, as as, as uh, you, know, you, you may be aware, Jason Moore and I uh, conspired this book, uh, History of the World in Seven Cheap Things. Um, now, every one of those words is doing a bit of work. Um, you know, the word history is our nod to the idea that all history is the history of class struggle. Uh, cheap 
uh, is the idea that there you know capitalism is a system that won't pay its bills uh, and things uh, is tremendously important here and we'll, we'll get to that in a second but the idea is that the, the capitalism's reification of uh, and, and uh, interpolation of certain uh, entities and beings as commodities. The turning of life into things, the turning of beings into things uh, is what it is that allows uh, capitalism to flourish. So, you know, in, in, in the book, we run through seven cheap things being nature, work, money, care, food, energy, and lives. Um, and uh, th th these may seem uh, fairly abstract. And in fact, the abstraction of these things is part of the violence that capitalism has exercised uh, through what we call the Capitalocene. Uh, if this is starting to sound a little bit technical, let's, let's break it down um, with just a quick example. Uh, but an example uh, that uh, will we'll draw on this idea of the countryside. So here's, um, uh, you know, in, in, in our discussion of, of capitalism and of seven cheap things, uh, we have this uh, sort of stand in for the world's most capitalist object. Uh, and the reason we, we choose chicken uh, is because, uh, as you know, in discussions of the Anthropocene, we're, we're often told, well, you know, uh, Anthropocene is a sort of stratigraphic term that uh, we'll be able to know because of deposits of radiation or of, uh, you know, uh, deposits of plastic. But, you know, th there will, uh, sedimented into the ground uh, as a marker of the Capitalocene, be trillions of chicken bones. Uh, that's because uh, you know, chicken is the world's most popular bird. Uh, we go through, you know, at any one time, I believe there are 12 billion alive, but of course they don't last very long. It's 90 days from, from egg to nugget. Uh, and uh, world poultry consumption is rising per capita in absolute terms. Uh, all of which to say is to say that there are it, right now trillions of chicken bones already in the earth, uh, and there are projected to be billions and billions more uh, just this year. So uh, to understand why the chicken nugget uh, is uh, an object that you should be interested in if you're interested in the countryside, um, let's think about why it is what it is and what it is that's required in order to make the chicken nugget this cheap food. Well, first of all, uh, and perhaps most importantly, uh, as readers of Jason Moore will know, uh, you need cheap nature. Um, the origins of the modern uh, broiler chicken are, are in uh, the, the forests of East and Southeast Asia. The, the red jungle fowl uh, was the original sort of bird whose genetic material was plucked from the countryside uh, and has been used uh, and you know, improved through state-sponsored breeding. For example, here in the United States, the United States Department of Agriculture uh, has uh, undertaken a lot of breeding uh, for pri the private sector, but at public expense, to turn this chicken into this chicken, uh, which is a, a bird with breasts so large it can't walk. Uh, and you know, public funds have been used uh, in order to transform again the sort of uh, the, the wild chicken taken from the countryside into uh, another kind of bird that also exists in a, another kind of countryside here in the United States. Uh, in the process, losing vast amounts of genetic diversity. Um, so you'll see here that in, in the invocation of the binary between nature and society, uh, the countryside is there doing work in the background. It is uh, the source of uh, an infinite variety of uh, genetic material. Uh, it is also the place where that genetic material is exploited uh, and rendered into commodity flesh. Um, but <clears throat> you know, chickens don't turn themselves into nug nuggets by magic, you need a labor force. Uh, and that labor force, of course, is, is subject to all kinds of violence. In the United States, uh, you know, one source for that labor force is uh, the prison industrial complex. Um, uh, and uh, you know, this, this cheap supply of workers actually has a new source in, in the United States, uh, one that, that's uh, you know, particularly dark. Uh, in in uh, Oklahoma here in the United States, um, we have uh, a, a great deal of suffering as a result of the, the drug, uh, the opioid epidemic. Uh, and enterprising chicken uh, executives uh, figured that what they could do is kill two birds with one stone uh, by creating uh, something called Christian Alcoholics and Addicts in Recovery. So it's a recovery center for uh, people who are dealing with uh, you know, as a diversionary program, it, you know, otherwise they either they go to jail or they can choose to enter a rehab program <clears throat> to get well as a result of their addiction to op opioids. Uh, and so by day, uh, they will pray to Jesus. 
by night when uh, workers in regular chicken plants are more expensive to come by, uh, these uh, repentant uh, and penitent uh, addicts are sent to work for free as part of their recovery, uh, sent to work in chicken production plants. Uh, and you know, because they are part of a treatment program, they don't require payment, uh, they don't particularly require a sophisticated insurance, uh, and they are a part of this sort of empire of cheap work, which ironically recalls the very first moment of cheap work uh, under colonial capitalism in this part of the world, uh, where uh, when the conquistadors arrived, uh, they offered work as a way of saving the souls of indigenous people, uh, where work would happen six days of the week, and then occasionally they would be able to pray to Jesus for salvation. Uh, and of course, that's exactly what's happening here. So this cheap work regime uh, is required, uh, but it's it, it, think of what what the hinterland is here. Uh, you know, the countryside here is the source of, uh, you know, of the penitent worker. Uh, this is either, you know, the, the countryside then becomes the prison industrial complex, becomes uh, this area into which governance is extended in order to find labor to be able to make these nuggets. Um, uh, of course, you know, the, the, uh, the, the domain of this, uh, you know, of, of this work is precisely uh, a, a violent one. Uh, and uh, th there are vast amounts, of, I mean, there's a large literature on the kinds of damage uh, that bodies sustain while engaging in the work of making this agricultural product. Um, and uh, in order to provide care, uh, I mean, as I say, th th there is substandard insurance here in the United States, for instance, for workers who are involved in uh, this kind of uh, production. Uh, and you know, you you'll be familiar in Europe with the way that uh, workers in meat processing factories were you know, the first to get COVID because these, these were sites of disease. Uh, th these were, you know, the, the, the meat production facilities were exactly the place where the most vulnerable uh, members of the working class uh, were, were sent to uh, provide cheap meat and to sacrifice their lives in order that th there be this cheap product. Um, in, in the United States, uh, healthcare for those workers was fairly minimal until uh, you know, a, a short burst of socialized medicine uh, from which America is now uh, rapidly recovering. Uh, but there's been the longer term uh, vision for who it is that pro should provide care. And of course, that's, that's a very gendered uh, phenomenon. Uh, and in the United States, uh, you know, these are the only figures for which I've, I've, you know, the only years for which I've got data, but you know, it, it globally rather in 1995, when gross world product was $33 trillion, uh, the amount of unpaid work that allows capitalism to flourish was $16 trillion, of which $11 trillion was women's unpaid work. Uh, and so the countryside here might be understood as the household. Uh, there is a hinterland into which uh, the tentacles of capitalism spread and depend, uh, and one could understand and think of uh, a, a countryside in every household in which unpaid labor uh, and the, the, you know, the work of the patriarchal dividend is provided. Uh, and let, you know, we, we'll, we'll certainly, and we can and should, get back to uh, how patriarchy and capitalism intersect in the countryside. Um, but I also just want to observe that, you know, it, the irony here is that this nugget is part of a, a sort of complex of cheap food um, in, in the United States, but, uh, you know, generally in the global north, uh, cheap food has been the uh, the alternative to higher wages. Uh, cheap food is the, the technology through which urban unrest is managed. Uh, this is the technology that worked through the Green Revolution. It's the technology that continues to work uh, and pay dividends in the United States. Uh, and it's something that's uh, becoming undone in, this, in particular in this era of, of in, uh, food price inflation. Uh, but it's something just to, to, rem, you know, to remind oneself that in fact, cheap food uh, is, is precisely that first thing that we saw when thinking about uh, the allegory of good uh, and bad governance the cheap food needed to flow into the city and be well managed in order for the system to work well. Uh, so uh, when the peasants and or the workers get restive, uh, that is a breakdown in the allegory of uh, good and uh, bad government uh, and cheap food is required in order for capitalism to thrive. Um, you also need, of course, cheap energy, uh, you know, not only to keep the, you know, the, the sort of hen houses warm, uh, but also uh, to fuel the apparatus of uh, industrial capitalism, uh, and uh, you know, as we're we're seeing today, of course, those those em emissions are uh, have reached such a stage uh, that we have caused irreversible damage to our climate. The IPCC's report uh, released today uh, is a reminder uh, that 
our dependence on uh, the, 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 the sort of countryside of the land underground, the hinterland uh, through which uh, oil and natural gas uh, fuels this system uh, is one that is absolutely sort of driving us towards destruction. Um, also important to remember that this system requires cheap money. Now, what you know, uh, every uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken here in the United States, every uh, fast food uh, business, if it's not owned by the main, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the central company, is a franchise uh, eligible for cheap loans, uh, you know, sub uh, uh, sub market uh, rate loans from the federal government and from the Small Business Administration. Um, and again, you know, that vast reserve of currency for particular kinds of enterprise are, is required in order for capitalism's wheels to turn. Uh, the Federal Reserve uh, is the gift that uh, won't stop giving to certain constituencies, even though uh, the, you know, other constituencies are designed to suffer the consequences, whether that's uh, you know, the working class being subject to payday loans or whether that's about the sort of collateral damage of federal policy on large parts of the global south when the Fed decides to uh, do things like raise interest rates. Um, and finally, of course, you know, we, we live this, uh, you know, we experience the, this, this agricultural domain, uh, this agricultural production system uh, under cover of racial capitalism. Uh, and you know, I'm fully in agreement with uh, the idea that race is the modality through which classes lived uh, as, uh, you know, I mean, uh, th th this is Stuart Hall's big idea, or one of Stuart Hall's many big ideas, but you know, it's, it's important uh, to recognize uh, that through this production system, and obviously Europe's no uh, different here, uh, the, the, the idea that some lives are cheaper than others, that some uh, are ready to be sacrificed, you know, some are much easier to sacrifice than others is, uh, Rec you know, is, is played out not just in uh, the production uh, of meat and poultry, but uh, through society writ large. Uh, and so that, that's why it's important just to recognize that we live uh, not in the Anthropocene, but the, the Capitalocene. So that's the, 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 the sort of idea of seven cheap things. Um, but doing a lot of work behind the background, uh, sorry, in the, in the background is the idea of the countryside as a frontier. Um, and it's important, I think, to, to sort of embrace this. Uh, you know, it, it's not um, uh, original. I mean, D David Harvey points out, for instance, uh, that uh, you know Marx ends Capital Volume One uh, with a, a, what appears to be a sort of strange uh, sort of dogleg into a discussion around colonialism. Uh, but in fact, there's a reason that Marx ends Capital Volume One with the discussion of colonialism. Uh, David Harvey sort of spells that out with his discussion of, of the, the, the idea of spatial fixes. Um, and that's something that seems eminently reasonable. I mean, you know, we, we think of the origins of capitalism. The, the, the frontier is this moment, is, is uh, the, the sort of process uh, and product through which capitalism's fix uh, is enabled. One of the, the places that we talk about, uh, Jason and I uh, talk about that drawing on Jason's work uh, around Madeira uh, is the, the sort of zone of the, the, the frontier uh, in which sugar production was uh, you know, brought together these seven cheap things. Madeira, the island of wood, wood was rendered uh, a place devoid of wood in 75 years, more or less, because of the sugar complex. Um, and it's very interesting, of course, that the sugar complex persists uh, in certain ways, but uh, frontiers are, are not the sort of moving uh, space that uh, you know, capitalism exhausts Madeira of its sugar and then moves on. Uh, when you know, the, the frontier is this zone of governance uh, and a zone of multiple kind of competing forms of governance. And once uh, you have uh, certain modes of governance established, certain modes of uh, capitalist uh, institution established, then while the sugar may run out, uh, there's always new ways of exploiting territory and uh, turning something into new modalities of, if you like, the countryside. Uh, and so after Madeira stopped being productive as a, a, an island of, of sugar manufacturing, um, it became a way station for the transatlantic trade and enslaved people. Uh, and now, of course, uh, it is a zone of 
thanatourism. You can go to Madeira uh, and find, uh, you, know, you know, find Madeira as a, a sort of rural playground for uh, you know, Europeans to, to, to go sort of frolic and still uh, go to visit sites of sugar production uh, and enjoy them uh, as, uh, you know, tourist destinations. So, you know, the idea of thinking about Madeira this way is to think of it as uh, a countryside that has transformed uh, and transformed because of the imposition of uh, this regime of seven cheap things that requires a sort of continual uh, invention and reinvention of itself as a zone uh, of capitalist production. Um, now, it, it's important to, to, to sort of recognize what it is that capitalism particularly produces. In order to produce its seven cheap things, uh, there's, there, there's some work going on in the background uh, that is tremendously important uh, and comes to be able to answer uh, the question that I began this talk with, with uh, the idea of when, where, and with whom is the capital is is the anthropocene so when we're thinking about the capitalocene uh, it, it's important to recognize that capitalism uh, in order to uh, render legible uh, and profitable the planet uh, re requires certain kinds of standards uh, of time space and relationship so uh, Obviously, capitalism doesn't invent time, but it does. Uh, it invents a certain kind of regulation of the working day and a smoothing of notions of temporality so that uh, there is but one clock to which uh, all must bow. Uh, and the idea of you know, a, a temporality that is ruled by that clock tower, for example, uh, in Ypres, uh, where the, the the cloth hall were yeah, and the, the bells of the cloth hall regulated the working day um, is tremendously important when we think about uh, the kinds of alternative temporalities uh, and simultaneous alternative temporalities that need to be extinguished so that one clock can matter. Uh, similarly, uh, there is an invention of space. I mean, you know, obviously, uh, Mercator, uh, you know, we, we know Mercator's projection. Mercator, of course, chooses his name Merchant Mercator. Uh, and it's, you know, when one thinks of the, the projections of the maps that he draws, um, these are you know, maps that are intended for commerce, right? The rum lines there are precisely lines that, uh, you know, that, that guide uh, colonial traffic. Uh, and the invention of space uh, and the smoothing of space uh, into space that is legible uh, by uh, the, the forces of colonial capitalism, I, I think, uh, again, there's nothing terribly new about this, but it's important to recognize that uh, in understanding and traversing and managing the, the space between country and city and the lines between country and city, capitalism requires certain kinds of standardized metric. And similarly, uh, the invention of relations is important, right? In, in order for us to get our chicken nuggets, uh, we need to stop recognizing certain beings as beings. Uh, we need to recognize that uh, that it is possible to understand chickens not as uh, you know a, a, a sort of fellow uh, living beings, but as someone in Brazil explained it to me, as soy with feathers. Uh, and that idea that uh, again, what one the, the, the capitalism requires the extinguishing of certain kinds of person personhood and certain narratives of. Uh, how it is that we relate to one another uh, and to the rest of society and the rest of nature. Again, this is the nature society boundary uh, that uh, Jason uh, and you know, uh, Jason has uh, sort of pioneered thinking about uh, in certain ways and uh, that we talk about a little bit more in the reading. So this helps get us to the discussion that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to spending a bit of time on, uh, though not a whole lot now, I'm, I'm, I'm clear running down the clock. Um, but we're now equipped, I think, to think about how, uh, how to answer this question of when, where, and with whom is the capital is seen. Uh, and I want to do this by uh, reminding you, right? We, we began this talk by thinking about uh, the, the relationship between countryside and city and thinking about governance and thinking about uh, the ways that the frontier uh, is simultaneously, you know, is a place of constant capitalist reinvention. Um, now, I, I want to introduce you to this idea. Uh, I want to introduce you to Yanomami territory. And a territory, of course, is uh, a tremendously interesting word because it, it stands in opposition to land. Um, territory is not fungible. 
in the way that land is. Um, when, you know, I, I mean, I, I work uh, with the international peasant movement, La Via Campesina, and there's a very uh, live debate uh, between peasant activists who look for land and indigenous activists who want a return of specific territory because territory itself is laden with stories, uh, with meaning, with uh, history that cannot be uh, swapped for a different territory, right? Territory is imbricated with and always uh, instantiated in the, the stories and living relationships of the, the human and more than human communities on it. So in order to turn territory into land, first of all, you have to abstract it in the way that we talked about in, in terms of the relationships of space uh, that, that geographers are, you know, that, that uh, you know, cartographers uh, under capitalism have done. Uh, but then we need to recognize that it's not just the surface of the land that's up for grabs. Um, and so let's look at this, this territory where the indigenous community, the, the Yanomami indigenous community um, are fighting a number of simultaneous battles uh, against commodification. Uh, one kind of commodification is that of gold. Uh, now, you know, the, Brazil uh, has been sort of characterized by long histories of gold mining. Um, and right now in Yanomami territory, uh, there is the, the sort of pockmarked landscape of artisanal gold mining. I think this is, this is, this is worth spending just a little bit of time on uh, because uh, you, you have these artisanal gold mining operations, small scale uh, gold uh, gold miners who are uh, flying into Yanomami territory in you know northern Brazil and southern Venezuela. Um, they are uh, you, the, the state of uh, Roraima, where gold mining is illegal, has nonetheless been implicated in providing resources for these encampments, you know, the, the uh, of the kind that you see here in indigenous territory. Um, for 10 grams of gold, uh, a pilot and jet fuel uh, can be purchased to, you know, to, to fly in resources uh, for uh, the gold miners here to be able to extract gold and then, uh, again, uh, participate in uh, cycles of uh, accumulation and exchange. Um, but, you know, there's, you know, despite the fact that this is illegal, uh, there is uh, an association of independent pro prospectors, of uh, garimpeiros, um, and as the uh, indigenous, uh, as the government's uh, defense of uh, indigenous communities in this area has tried to make their work increasingly difficult, the federal government, uh, at, at a local and state level, uh, there's, you know, the, the state has been enabling this kind of extraction. And it's very interesting to look at the modes in which the workers, uh, the the you know, the the, the um, are defending themselves. They, they say, "Look, we are proletarians. We are workers, uh, and uh, you know they don't understand why it is that indigenous people can be taken to a climate summit, but uh, that the proletarians who mine uh, independently mine this particular bit of forest can't be taken to the United Nations too." Um, and uh, you know, the head of this, uh, you know, the, the association of gold miners, uh, of independent gold miners, said, "Look, we are the founders of the state." Uh, uh, so the, the woman who said that, Isa Karina Fajas, uh, is the, the the president of the independent prospectors of Roraima, uh, and she says that we are uh, we are the, the most pure Brazilians. We are colonists. There is a, a, a department of colonization in Brazil. There is no more Bra Brazilian thing to do than to go into the forest and steal stuff. Uh, or, or to mine, sorry, uh, and to uh, to extract from the land uh, and to, to claim for humans against nature uh, at this bit of the countryside. And so she feels, uh, and you know, the independent miners feel that they are part of an apparatus of nationhood uh, that has been well established in other parts of Brazil, uh, and they're slightly baffled as to why it is that now indigenous people are getting a certain amount of love, not a whole lot, admittedly, but uh, some protection from the state when the state has been set up historically to extract resources from the countryside and what you call that is being Brazilian. So I, I want to just plant that flag of what the countryside is doing, the language of the countryside, to, to observe that there is not merely the sort of apparatus of extraction, but the apparatus of nationhood uh, and of state formation in the process of extraction from the countryside. Uh, the second thing I, I want to observe is that uh, it's not just gold that's being taken out from the land. Uh, and it's not just uh, gold that is the, the uh, you know, gold as a commodity that, that is uh, valuable in indigenous territory. Um, 
the the land in Brazil, the land in the Amazon, uh, is particularly rich in carbon. Uh, and as global financial interests uh, start to pivot towards uh, ESG, you know, sort of environmental and uh, social and governance uh, issues, and that there's uh, increasingly trillions of dollars uh, of investment money looking for return on uh, investment in carbon sequestration. All of a sudden, the land underneath uh, th this particular forest is starting to become uh, rather valuable um, as a source uh, of carbon sequestration. Um, and this is an ambivalent outcome uh, because you know it allows peasants and low-income land workers to supplement their income enough to survive uh, if they are buying, you know, if they're being paid uh, for their participation in red, for instance, uh, or red plus. Um, but this monetization of the climate crisis allows a new kind of exploitation of the subterranean countryside, uh, as Jair Bolsonaro puts it. Um, this this rich biome uh, makes Amazonia quote like a virgin that every pervert from the outside lusts for, end quote. Uh, so again, you know, one can see the sort of uh, the work of capitalist reproduction uh, echoed uh, in the, 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 the sort of language, of course, that Bolsonaro uh, uses, but also uh, in the, the, the problematic circulation of different kinds of regimes of governance uh, that seek not to render the illegal legal, uh, but to create new kinds of commodities through which finance can flow right underneath the, uh, the feet of indigenous communities. Now, uh, it's worth asking, uh, you know, the, why is this particular land so good at sequestering carbon? Well, you know, uh, it's because indigenous communities haven't uh, destroyed it. I mean, you know, indigenous communities are less than 5% of the world's population, uh, but they manage 25% of the world's land service uh, surface and steward 80% of the world's biodiversity. Uh, that, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the fact that uh, the nature society boundary uh, that capitalism is quite fond of seems so bizarre to so many indigenous communities. Uh, I think gestures towards uh, the, 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 the capitalist contingency of the idea of countryside. Um, and this means that th this rich biodiversity uh, is available not just for gold uh, you know, and for, for sort of carbon sequestration, but for something really rather unusual. Uh, and it comes from the fact uh, that life in, uh, in this particular bit of Yanomami territory has uh, allowed uh, Yanomami humans uh, to, uh, to survive and thrive in ways uh, that uh, we in the global north have not. Um, now, I, 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 this is rather a dense slide, but I, I think that the, the important thing to observe uh, here uh, is that uh, in the global north, uh, in, in the United States, I'm going to just sort of bring your attention to the top left here. Uh, there are uh, uh, indicators of inflammation, systemic inflammation in our bodies uh, that uh, are characteristic of, uh, of many people who live in cities in the global north. And that's uh, that level of inflammation happens in large part because we have been so successful in exterminating the life around us. Uh, our internal microbiomes uh, are now denuded of certain kinds of living being that are required in, in order for us to, to, to live a healthy life. Uh, and there are many more diseases of uh, inflammatory diseases uh, linked to uh, and associated with deficiencies in our gut microbiome to the extent uh, you know, th th where uh, those levels uh, of inflammation and those levels of inflammatory marker are much, much lower in Yanomami communities who live in northern Brazil uh, and southern Venezuela. Uh, and that's because they haven't exterminated the rest of the world around them. Their, their microbiomes allow them to, uh, to live with diseases that uh, in uh, humans in uh, you know, North America, for example, would uh, result in symptomatic disease. Uh, and in, uh, in Yanomami communities, although those uh, the pathogens may be in uh, Yanomami bodies, they do not result in, in, in symptoms because the microbiome uh, is so rich that those, you know, that, that as far as we can hypothesize, uh, there are certain kinds of diseases for which Yanomami uh, microbiomes are uh, effective in uh, rendering uh, certain kinds of diseases uh, uh, not you know, asymptomatic. So um, all of this is to say, uh, there's, you know, it, it's super interesting that there are certain kinds of internal microbiome that work well to treat diseases in the global north. And we know that because some anthropologists have in fact 
taken Yanomami shit uh, and put it into capsules and treated people with certain kinds of inflammatory uh, bowel disease in the global north uh, and have used uh, Yanomami shit as a, as a, a treatment um, for the diseases that the capital has seen uh, has caused. Um, if this should give you pause, I'm, I'm glad uh, because you know even the New York Times uh, is a little bit concerned uh, about how uh, you know yes you're missing microbio you're missing microbes but is rewilding the way to get them back I mean you know, the, 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 it, I mean it's 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 true that there is uh, some clinical evidence to suggest that actually taking Yanomami shit works uh, if you have certain kinds of inflammatory disease uh, but it, you, you know you would do well uh, to to uh, you know think about the ethics of this. Um, because, of course, uh, the, the first great pioneer of um, understanding the Americas as a countryside, uh, you know, precedes you in thinking, uh, and this is a line that, that uh, you know, Jason and I use in uh, Seven Cheap Things, uh, but, you know, when Christopher Columbus comes over, he says, oh, I can never tire my eyes of looking at such lovely vegetation, so different from ours. I believe that there are many herbs, many trees that are worth more, uh, much in Europe for dyes and for medicines, but I do not know them, and this causes me great sorrow. Um, so again, you know, the, the idea of the frontier, uh, and you know, Christopher, Christopher Columbus is the, the, the sort of frontiersman uh, you know, par excellence, uh, because uh, you know, he understands that in fact, the, the idea of the frontier is precisely the transformation uh, of certain kinds of uh, thing into profit. Uh, and that's, you know, th th that returns us to the question we began with, uh, which is, all right, well, when, where, and with whom is the Capitalocene. Uh, and the terms in which we answer the, uh, when, where, and with whom are already in some ways prefigured by the language of capitalism. Uh, our, you know, if, if our discussion of when is a discussion of, uh, of certain kinds of temporality that are measured in uh, capitalism's uh, rhythms, uh, if the geography and the geographic coordinates uh, of where the Capitalocene happens is passed by, uh, you know, the, the the latitude and longitude of, um, uh, of, uh, of, 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 I mean, if you can see it on Google Maps, uh, and if you answer the question of with whom, uh, without understanding the sort of, the, 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 the many parallel narratives that might exist uh, with, and uh, in resistance to the, the, uh, um, the, uh, the avoidance of giving personhood to, to, to certain beings, then you are part, uh, you are unable to answer this question, right? To be able to answer when, where, and with whom the Capitalocene requires language that, it, that lies outside capitalism. So then what, what do we do? I mean, if every invocation of the countryside is an incitement to profit, what's the opposite of that? Uh, and, you know, bravely, I'm going to stop here uh, because I, I, th I think that, um, you know, if, if we want to think about subversion, there are lots of ways that we can, we can think of that. I mean, you know, we can think of different temporalities. We can think of uh, different uh, beings uh, as people. Uh, and we can think of different scales of space simultaneously narrated in new uh, ways, and in, indeed in, in some old ways, uh, you know, drawing on indigenous uh, wisdom, but also not you know, romanticizing. Uh, you know, I think one of my favorite things about the international peasant movement, La Via Campesina, is when it does uh, host meetings together, there are invocations of time and of space uh, and of the beings who are in the room that are fabricated. Uh, indigenous, um, uh, you know, the, the, the indigenous folk who see La Via Campesina's uh, Mistica, for example, the, the, the sort of ceremony that begins many Via Campesina meetings, uh, often laugh at it because it doesn't make any sense. There is no territory uh, into which uh, the, this peasant movement uh, is able to sort of pour its, uh, draw its stories from. And yet, in the reinvention of time and of beings and of space, uh, there is an attempt to resist the way in which capitalism interpolates certain kinds of peasantries. Uh, and I think that through you know, the, the, the work of La Via Campesina in terms of uh, you know, reconfiguring what it is that we might understand by uh, you know, where, when, and with whom the capitalist scene happens, uh, there may be a language that we, we can move beyond, uh, and we can, we can embrace to be able to move beyond capitalism. Um, but let me, um, let, let me stop there. Uh, and thank you very much for indulging me and um, for, for, your, for your time. I, I'm, I'm very excited for the hour or so that we've got uh, to hang out together.
Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Raj. This is a very uh, loud applause <laughs> Zoom style. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for uh, it's uh, it's great to really great to see what what you have put together. And I a um, couple of times I I mean there are a few things that really resonated with me. So like for instance, how you frame the term territory in relation to land that was for me very. Uh, interesting, exciting, because normally people somehow see it the other way around, you know, territory being the kind of a domain of, of state and of, uh, of um, you know, let's say state power um, um, and, you know, land is, is the, the uh, that, uh, let's say, a surface of, or, or a system of relationships which is being uh, abstracted and somehow, you know, metabolized in a, in a uh, uh, let's say, in a, in a kind of a capitalist uh, relations. So um, uh, I think this is, this is interesting, but why does it, why it works exactly, let's say, in, in, a, in a Spanish or Italian language, <laughs> you know, I think as, as a kind of opposite relation, and, and not in, let's say, English or, or uh, uh, other Anglo-Saxon Anglo languages. So this is something I'm, I'm really curious about. But uh, um, um, also you, you finished with the kind of uh, outlook uh, um, toward, uh, I would say, I mean, despite this uh, kind of, and, and you, you um, deconstructed it so well, this term countryside is hugely inappropriate, yet we, we used it because it was, you know, it is, it is something which, which gives us the, the kind of entry point into, into a debate. Uh, but uh, uh, let's say the, the kind of possibilities or models of, um, alternatives perhaps <laughs> that uh, that one uh, um, uh, finds nowadays in uh, in um, um, let's say in perhaps in an indigenous territory or in other in other uh, 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 countryside <laughs> let's say countryside areas where where people explore new models of uh, new, new types of economies I think this is uh, this is perhaps where where we could we could go uh, in uh, in uh, in this conversation as well. Uh, so uh, I uh, I would uh, I would uh, now love to invite our our uh, uh, guests De Debiani and Christian. Would you would you like to to uh, to join? Okay, do Christian, do you want to go first? <laughs> okay, okay. I this was okay. Thank you, thank you so much, Raj, uh, for this really, really provocative talk. I took copious notes, and uh, thanks for having me be part of this conversation as a historian over here. But this is also very, very useful for me to think through some of the things I am myself doing, which comes to the question of you know climate and carbon and carbon markets and things like that. But um, uh, what I will try to do is, I, I think there are three things I want uh, uh, to discuss with you, and one of them already I think Milicha raised about the uh, the la about the dichotomy between land and uh, territory, and I can see why you uh, you are raising you are talking about land being fungible, which uh, being trying being made into property, but also uh, what is it about? And I think she's right in pointing out: is it a, is it a matter of language? Is it a matter of Spanish? Portuguese uh, that allows us to think of territory differently and that's going to be that's a kind of an interesting contribution to people like us, or at least like me who works on the Anglosphere of colonial capitalism, where territory actually specifically we think through questions of jurisdiction, sovereignty, and, and you see the same thing coming between the peasant and the indigenous. Uh, and that, that's an interesting conversation. But let me go back. I really thought what's really, really exciting about the way is the definition you give of countryside. It's, it's the, and, and the countryside in your, if I understand correctly, in, in this new iteration of the work is households, a particular kinds of household labor, particular kind of unpaid labor, the reworking of relations, if I understand that colonialism or capitalism produces between patriarchy and work. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, it is also a place that you render and make it profitable, render eligible to make it profitable, which got me thinking about 
uh, two things, and I'll, I'll say how I'm thinking about it, is uh, why, why are you calling it countryside or if, or, or if there is any resonance you find with terms like the commodity frontier, which is, which is a term someone like, you know, Ulbe Bosama, Sven Beckert and people who are working on uh, the global countryside are trying to think through. Is it the global countryside or they are saying maybe, maybe when we think in terms of the global countryside and that beautiful map you showed where, you know, the frontier territories began, these are all the global countrysides where you see over a series of period, colonial capitalism is really opening up and uh, producing these areas for the experimentation with governance, with law, with forms of labor regime and disciplining. So, to, so the question is to think in terms of, is it is it really a question of commod, uh, countryside or uh, uh, will we be able to think in terms of commodity front? And the answer may be absolutely no, because you are also saying, look, we have to also look at the household. We have to look at the various kinds of relations of time, relations of space. So I was kind of curious about that. The second question, and this I'm thinking very carefully about your example from the Yomami landscape and Brazil, and this keeps coming up. And, I, and this is the question of subterranean. Because the examples you bring are of the subterranean elements. This is gold and this is carbon sequestration. And the subterranean becoming really, really important. And I think that's really wonderful. And in another, I will add to this uh, um, uh, exploration of the subterranean of the countryside is also where all our rare earth minerals is. That's going to be the new commodity frontier, which is actually the seabed. Like we are going really deep, 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 uh, subterranean. And once we start going subterranean, I wonder if your work allows you to theorize legibility. Because in some ways, we continue to work with a James Scottian notion of legibility, right? You render it homogeneous, you render it legible, you render it countable. But what form of obfuscation is occurring over here? Are there any space for obfuscation? Are there any space precisely because it is subterranean? It is either below the sea level, below the soil level, below the land. What is the category? How is the category of legibility working? Or do we require new kinds of legibility? And how does then that subterranean allow us to then theorize the question of the countryside or commodity, countryside as a frontier, or commodity as a frontier. And I think that is probably something I, your work really provoked and allowed me to think because often when we think in terms of carbon sequestration, we think in terms of, em, we begin from the air, right? From the emissions. Whereas you're saying, no, there is something that's going on where the landscape will change precisely because what the biome holds together. And then finally, the and I think the last question that I had was the question, I think, is it, is it just language or is there something else that your work is telling us about the equation between land and territory, which overturns the way, for instance, a historian like me has read land, land is equal to property, you know, and the propertizing tendencies of land and what your work is doing by rethinking territory in this manner. So I, I think these are my very uh, rough thoughts that came as I listened to your really, really brilliant, wonderful talk. And now I'm curious to hear what Christian says and look forward to the discussion. Okay, so now you can hear me. Um, um, yeah, I mean, this is a very, very, very inspiring talk and, and also um, <laughs> already a very inspiring commentary. And I think there is a whole range of questions here that we will never be able to discuss just in the next, uh, I don't know, in the next half an hour or an hour or so. Um, but the, I, I think for me, two things here are really, or two observations are key. Uh, I think, first of all, I also step into the question of territory and land. Um, there is, of course, also the term space. And um, it's interesting um, because we follow that same track. I mean, when I say we, then I mean um, uh, ETH Studio Basel um, and, uh, of course, also my collaboration with Neil Brenner, but also here, of course, Neil Zotopolovic. Uh, so, um, that we somehow um, quite early on um, developed um, a kind of a different understanding or followed, I have to say, we followed the, let's say, Italian, from our perspective, the Italian and French understanding of their territory. So, uh, territorio and uh, territoire. And they, they have, of course, um, I, I mean, from there in, in the French, territoire, it means indeed 
a kind of appropriated space. So, so the so the, uh, the, the the territory as a, as a living relationship. I think that that fits quite well with the with this French understanding, and um, and and the Italian understanding. Um, there is a, even a um, a territorial school, um, particularly in northern Italy, in in um, um, in, in 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 Florence um, and Milano, uh, and 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 there is uh, this is a kind of an understanding that. Um, on, on that that looks at the, the, the layering the layering of of territories or the different layers that are developed uh, and and the physical ones i mean in the sense of the anthropocene or capitalocene or even <laughs> The the, 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 the the all all the different I mean we could even go go back in history here, um, but on on the other hand um, and then we have the land and of course from a Marxist understanding we have um, capital um, labor and land, and, um, and that of course would be another whole debate. But if we go, for instance, with Henri Lefebvre, then he somehow made exactly that point of the land as an element of capital, no? a, a, key, a key aspect of his serialization. And um, it turned out that this understanding of land and his focus on land um, is something that is quite uh, interesting also for post-colonial approaches. So, um, and the land question has a very different, is a very different question in, um, in, 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 in former colonies than let's say uh, in, in, in the core countries of capitalism. So I, I think here that, that that opens a whole range of um, let's say ambiguities, misunderstandings, uh, but I think they are quite they are really productive. So so it gives us suddenly a, a much broader um, let's say view and 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 many more options to think about these all these different relationships and also to understand that um, let's say the English um, the Anglo-Saxon understanding is not the only one that we should um, somehow so, somehow follow so that there are many other very very interesting um, approaches here so one one idea about that and now the second is about the countryside and that's um, um, that's a kind of um, well, the city and the countryside. I mean, this. I, I, I think it's it's really interesting, uh, Raj, that you that you started. With, I think Milica knows that very well. <laughs> it's, I have seen several contributions also with this same kind of the good and the bad governance um, in Siena. Uh, and 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 I, I think this is this also tells us something about. Um, where um, certain understandings are somehow constructed, because this is, of course, a construction. It's a very specific understanding. We could go, we, we could go to T Toscana in the in the in the in the in the fifteenth century and 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 discuss about the um, let's say development of capitalism and the the, the, the close relationship um, between the city and um, and 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 actually the countryside that still had a meaning there um, and and how capitalism also was extremely dependent, directly dependent. The, the rise of capitalism was directly dependent also on um, the production of value in the countryside. Now, the point here is if you, if you make now the link to, to your talk, if you go from, um, from Siena in the, in the 15th century to um, Latin America today, um, suddenly you, you are in a very different situation with, um, and you were talking basically now about indigenous people. And I mean, we were discussing in the last years a lot about these questions, um, particularly of course, Neil Brenner, who is also here in the audience somewhere, uh, and, and I, when we developed our concept of extended, uh, of, of planetary organization, following Lefebvre's famous um, hypothesis of the complete urbanization of society um, and, and, and thinking about how, how, ca how can we apply that? How can we somehow operationalize these kind of concepts and, and make them fruitful? And in these debates, of course, at the beginning, I personally, and I started with this project already um, 
I would say, almost 40 years ago in, in, a, in a different context of a group of uh, still were students in Zurich reading Lefebvre. And, and, and then we started with this understanding of complete urbanization. And then we said, yeah, OK, we, we looked at Switzerland. And we said, OK, stop, stop with our countryside. That countryside doesn't exist anymore. This is just a political vehicle. And it's just an illusion. And it's just an ideology. And you make politics with it. But we tell you it's on the tracks of Lefebvre. This, uh, this countryside that you think is an entity doesn't exist uh, like that anymore. It is, it is um, somehow in a, in a process of transformation, in a massive process of transformation. And we followed up that. Now, um, now, now the danger here is that we start to universalize certain experiences. And I think the, the, the key, particularly in the last time, and we had quite some debates about this question of the, the city and the countryside and complete urbanization. Um, actually, um, well, in, in the revisiting quite some, um, again, some of my old positions and uh, and, and reading some other, um, um, let's say, positions. And, and in our seminar, there will be still a great debate about that, um, about the agrarian questions in the plural. And so maybe to, to, to come to an end here. Um, so I came to the conclusion that um, it's actually um, very dangerous to, talk, to, to, to generalize, to universalize the country um, city relationship or the town country in the English term, the town, the town country relationship. Um, this doesn't exist as such. It's something that is highly specific. And uh, we made a whole project at ETH Studio Boss about the specificity um, of um, urban spaces. Now, um, we should also talk about the specificity of what is called rural spaces or what is called um, um, countryside, and particularly the relationship between city and countryside. That's, that's something highly specific, and it means quite something else in India, in Switzerland, in the US, in, in, in Latin America, in, 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 in people with, uh, in, in, in areas with Indi that, that, are, that are still in the hands of indigenous people. Um, I, I think, I think we, sh we would learn much more and we would understand much more if we somehow, um, I would say, pluralize these situations and, and, and really also, also become clear that um, it was not always the fact that the city somehow was the place of capitalism and the countryside was just exploited. I think there were other times, other, other historical periods and, um, and, and other situations. So it, it's, not, it, it's not this one way road. It, I think it's something that is much more complex and particularly much more contradictory. Uh, great. Do you, uh, <laughs> Neil is clapping, uh, you can uh, almost hear it. Uh, Raj, would you like to respond uh, in any way or uh, perhaps I'm, I'm, you know, I, I uh, are you? I, I, well, I, I see Neil's turned his camera on. I'd love to, I'd love to hear from him as well. I, I'm, if, <laughs> absolutely, if absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to speak now, but I'm I'm also very happy to listen for a while and make comments later. I mean, I have some reflections, but there's a lot on the table already, and I don't want. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, especially some of the earlier remarks that Deb Johnny made about um, how your approach articulates to the debate on the global countryside and the geographies of the global countryside in the Sven Beckert at all kind of discussion which I think is, is a kind of parallel stream to the debate on territory that Christian articulated, but which um, you know, is operating with a particular approach to commodities and the global history of commodities and commodity frontiers. So in a certain way, it's, it's almost like a triangulation of several approaches here. If we situate that approach alongside your work with Jason Moore on world ecology, and then the particular spatializations that Christian articulated via some of the work that he and colleagues have done on questions of the production of space and territory and planetary urbanization. I mean, that's at least, there's at least that there's probably other streams and threads here as well, of course, but that's already a very complex triangulation, which I have some thoughts on, but I'm 
I'm kind of hesitant to, to no. add more no, 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 to no, that no, triangulation no. when it's already quite quite heavy already, no? Oh, no, no, no. It's a doddle. What? I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Neil, if, if, if you wouldn't mind. Okay. Well, since Raj is inviting me as well, I'll, I'll offer, I'll, I will. So, so here's yet another slice into this, which again, I think it's, it's very consistent with the discussion so far where we're kind of wrestling with problems with inherited ways of thinking about these matters and the limits of existing categories. And all of us, I think one of the things that brings a lot of people in this room together is the search for, for new concepts in relation both to emergent transformations, but also, of course, that requires us to rethink the historical geographies and world ecologies of capitalism. And that's been really at the heart of my collaboration and you know, intellectual dialogue with Christian for, you know, since we've known each other, even before we started working together. So against that background, I'll just first of all reaffirm from my point of view, that the, the urban rural divide is just such, or the city countryside divide, despite the incredible sophistication of what someone like Raymond Williams did with it, it's just such an incredibly blunt instrument for dealing with the actual questions that we're, we're trying to understand. So I very much take to heart Chris John's concluding injunction that we should pluralize not just our understanding of city building and what we've called elsewhere concentrated urbanization, but also the countryside. But that proposition is somewhat in tension with Chris John's opening remark regarding Lefebvre and the ways in which the, you know, the kind of triad of land, labor, and capital in Marx is embedded within certain systemic dynamics. And you know, Chris John and I are also you know, very much committed to sort of developing some abstract theories through which to understand the changing historical geographies of those systemic dynamics. So which brings me in a certain way to your work with, with Jason Moore, Raj. And what's very important in a lot of that work, and which of course you, you brought to the fore here, is the appropriation capitalization dialectic. So in other words, that every, every sort of wave or thrust of capitalization in the global history of capitalism is premised upon the appropriation of unpaid work and labor and that's, of course, deeply gendered and racialized. And in one stream of your work with Jason, in which you also brought to the foreground here, at least at the beginning of your remarks, that the geography of that dialectic, the capitalization appropriation dialectic, is theorized through the metaphor of the frontier. And again, Debjani raised, uh, in, in a certain way, the same question. And what I would suggest as a comradely provocation is that the concept of the frontier, I've, I've made the same argument in dialogue with Sven Beckert and his colleagues. The concept of the frontier is also a very blunt instrument. <laughs> in other words, I mean, we can have a whole conversation about the frontier, but basically in a nutshell, it, it seems to imply, despite the substance of what you and Jason, and Sven and colleagues and others have argued, a kind of inside outside divide. In other words, there's the frontier and it moves outward. It's kind of an absolute conception of space. And again, there's something going on there because the frontier does move around in relation to the patterns and pathways of combined and uneven geographical development on a world scale and at every spatial scale from the scale of you know, the Amazon or the river or the, micro, the microbiome in our belly all the way out to the, to the biosphere, agreed. But nonetheless, there's, there's something that we need to unpack related to the actual production of spatial configuration and land use in conjunction with the drive through the waves of capitalization that you and Jason and others have analyzed to intensify metabolic throughput in pursuit of capital accumulation and profitability. And, and intensifying metabolic throughput in the field of capitalization hinges upon a fairly dynamic making and remaking of geographies of appropriation. And that's basically the hinterland and the countryside. And, and again, this speaks to sort of work in progress, you know, with several colleagues, but I'll just gesture towards the idea that once we think about capitalization in a kind of determinate geographical relation to specific zones dynamically changing zones of appropriation, which themselves undergo creative destruction, 
we actually have a pretty useful structural framework through which to start to analyze in very historically nuanced terms patterns and pathways of combined and uneven development, which connect zones of capitalization, whether they're within the city or within the, the so-called countryside, to broader in you know, sort of frequently rendered invisible zones of appropriation. So one other comment, and then I, I promise I'll stop. One thing that I find very interesting about the conceptual dyad appropriation capitalization is that, again, as you and Jason have argued, and as Jason's been arguing in other contexts as well in his ma major book, capitalization occurs within the city, but it also, you know, you know agro-industrial restructuring, extractive capitalism, logistics, like matrices across the planet, intensified capitalization. So in a certain way, if appropriation, if zones of appropriation are the hidden abodes, to use a term from Marx, and of course, reappropriated recently by Nancy, uh, Nancy Fraser, if zones of appropriation are the hidden abodes of zones of fields of capitalization, that there are all kinds of hidden abodes that are layered into these combined and uneven geographies. Zones of capitalization within the city hinge upon hidden abodes within the city. Zones of capitalization within non-city spaces of agro-industrial intensification, whether agrarian or otherwise, also hinge upon hidden abodes, whether it's fossil fuel inputs, water inputs, labor, you know, cheapened, racialized labor inputs, and so forth. So anyway, that's a whole nexus of questions. And then the other thing that I'll just put on the table as a bookmark, to which maybe we can return today, but certainly in other conversations, so all the externalizations, all the soci socio-metabolic externalizations of these processes, you know, the wasted human bodies, the wasted landscapes are also constitutively, constitutively connected to both appropriation and capitalization. And of course, they too have geographies within the city and within the non-city. And it seems to me that also has to be, if we can, historicized <laughs> and then integrated into our theory. Anyway, thank you for... Um, indulging that lengthy commentary. Thanks, Neil. Uh, always a, a great uh, pleasure to, to hear you, a uh, kind of a real uh, force. <laughs> so um, uh, how do we go on from here? I. Uh, we have. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to sit. Oh, in, happy. please, yes. <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to sit in silence um, because it, I, I think it'd be great for the students to have their, their questions. Uh, you know, to, to be able to have 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 a chance to to, to speak. I mean, I'm 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 writing a small essay here, uh, so um, I, I'd, I'd be grateful for for additional questions uh, just to see where people are, are at. Uh, so so that it's not just me talking. But I'm so grateful, Devjani, Christian, and Neil, for, for such. <laughs> great responses it's just really really helpful uh so i'm i and oddly and i i think it is possible i agree with all of you uh so um uh, so yeah no i mean i'm i'm if if, this, if we could have other questions i'd be very grateful because uh you know i'm we, we are all here for our students ultimately um, um there are uh, in fact uh, uh, many many other people in the auditorium who who work uh, at uh, uh, kind of a, a, a fields that uh, that are precisely, let's say, overlapping or or, or speaking to to your work, Raj. So I uh, I don't want to name anyone, but let's say they are. Uh, I would, uh, you know, we we have a, we have a, a doctoral uh, research uh, uh, on um, indigenous uh, territory perhaps pro processes of, uh, um, um, I would say, in indigenous empowerment or representation in the Andean Amazon through, through different kinds of making and remaking of territory and its institutions. Uh, we have, um, for instance, uh, uh, operationalization or landscapes of, of uh, operationalized plantation agriculture in uh, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, in the palm oil production. Um, I'm curious, um, 
just uh, just raise your hand or drop me a message and if not uh, uh, or while while waiting to to hear from you i will uh, i will go with the, with the questions so i'm i'm interested in uh, in um, uh, let's say country, let's say countryside so of course with 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 all the kind of uh, um you know brackets around this this term and kind of understanding in fact the the, the unevenness and the kind of plurality and so on um so let's see countryside as a as a kind of place of specific uh, resistance no? <laughs> and uh, you you speak uh, with uh, with a lot of uh, enthusiasm about via campesina i i don't know a lot about it but i i'd be you know, I, I'd be eager to to know more. I mean, of course, uh, or on how, you know, how they operate or how they they um, organize their their uh, efforts uh, presently. And uh, I uh, I think it's interesting. Uh, uh, you know, there are there are several. Uh, uh, Authors, interesting authors who wrote. You mentioned the uh, the Biani James Scott, who who in fact uh, wrote from from this sort of anarchist perspective about, um, um, let's say, uh, <laughs> living in a in a sort of dispersed manner and and on the land as a, precisely as a form of resistance, right? So that this is not uh, not simply a kind of a uh, uh, let's say city country binary it's a sort of specific uh, claim to to autonomy right and um, I uh, I believe for instance I come from uh, socialist Yugoslavia where I I uh, I mean I can remember uh, precisely let's say countryside functioning in that way so so let's say carving a kind of semi-autonomy from the socialist state and that autonomy also being somehow tolerated or granted you know uh, by that state as a matter of fact as a, as a kind of a you know as a particular political trade off right so i think that's uh, there are sort of interesting nuances in this sort of power distribution you know between centers and peripheries and also one additional uh, author who is very interesting in this respect is John Berger, who is uh, also, uh, you know, art uh, historian um, and who wrote uh, or so who declared, you know, in the in the in the mid 70s that he uh, needs to to document uh, peasant experience which is vanishing right so uh, so he was a kind of a person who who saw his task in documenting a vanishing existence right and did this for for specific uh, reasons or or you know he believed that there is a that there is a a value or or a, or a knowledge in these let's say vanishing practices or experiences that needs to be uh, preserved, you no, know, in in one way or the, or the other, or remembered. And so, for instance, he spoke uh, also, Raj, in a similar way about the kind of, uh, you know, conception of time, conception of um, space, of uh, you know, idea of of value, of justice, you know, being different than. Uh, that which which was already established within urban classes so he was searching for kind of describing uh, 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 a different type of uh, uh, let's say philosophy which is not a kind of materialist progressive orientation which he says was common to both socialism and capitalism you know so kind of underlies all modernity right whether socialist or capitalist so he was interested in a kind of peasant experience <laughs> i mean that indeed being a specific peasant experience which he found you know in the in the french jura and so on which is not you know not shared all over the world and so on so i uh, i i would be personally interested to turn attention also to that you know to the kind of a <laughs> let's say some kind of traditions and, and opportunities or forms of, of resistance but also knowledge you know in the in the uh let's say countryside 
And uh, while I was asking this question, I also saw Santiago's uh, <laughs> hand up. <laughs> um, would you join us, Santiago? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Milica, and uh, thank you, Raj. It was a very, very interesting uh, talk. And uh, it sparked actually two two questions and one, one comment, and I'll start by, by the questions, uh, which are very specific, which the first one is, if you could maybe tell us a little bit more about uh, how about your work with the Yanomami and how you came to them, specifically the Yanomami and not other indigenous uh, communities in, in, in South America or in other parts of the world. Uh, I'm more interested in, in, in that. And uh, the second thing, if you could also maybe explain a little bit more of uh, Villa Campesina that you were talking about. Uh, which brings me to the comment, which, because it's interesting to hear both that you're working with the indigenous communities, in this case, the Anamami and Villa Campesina, because in many contexts, campesinos in, in where I'm working, which is the Andean Amazon that uh, Melitza was referring to, are sort of uh, the other side of indigenous people. Campesinos are the colonists that came and are working on agriculture in contrast to the indigenous people that were there before which in many in many cases not not always but many cases are not or were not working with agriculture so campesinos and uh, and uh, indigenous in many contexts are seen as sort of the two sides of of the types of people that occupy a, a territory and uh, this is interesting because many times when we're looking we're, we're, when we're thinking of indigenous people we sort of we we end up in the binary of indigenous people versus the West or versus uh, colonizers. And I think that for me is very problematic because then it's it's just, you know, a typical binary or dialectic which, where I think there's a much, much, much richer gray zone which is occupied by uh, campesinos, for example, or by people that occupy the land but that are not necessarily self-described as indigenous people. And I'm very interested in what you mentioned about, uh, about Brazilians of the Brazilian way of doing things is to, to going into the forest, you know, and there's nothing more Brazilian than going into the forest, forest and extracting. And in a way, it is a different type of indigeneity when, when there's this relationship with the forest or with, or, or with nature that I would love if you could uh, explain a bit more, because I think that's, uh, that's, it's very, it's very rich. And it sort of breaks this binary, this avatar binary. I remember when, when watching, I, I guess all of you have watched the avatar film, which is really about, you know, this pristine indigenous community taking care of the forest and the multinational coming for resource extraction. And even though that story is true, there's a lot of gray space in the middle, which is, which are people that are also extracting or colonizing, but not from the multinational or Western perspective, but also more, let, let's say more from a victim perspective, you when you're forced to enter a land and occupy it and extract from it and quote unquote, sometimes destroy it, but it's because you need to further your livelihood. And there's a lot of colonization going on, especially in the Amazon, which is not this multinational or, or uh, you know, or, 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 you know, evil Western colonization, let's say it's this uh, victim, colon victimized colonization. And I think that's, that's a very interesting uh, place to, to, to research because you, can, you cannot end up in these, in these, in these binaries of, of West versus indigenous, but you have to talk about this very, very gray, gray zone. So I think, yeah, that comment is sort of a comment slash question and I'd love to hear uh, your opinion and also Christian Niels and, and the Bianis on, on this. In that case, uh, because otherwise it would just get boring for everyone, uh, me agreeing with everyone who comes before me, I, I, I'm going to respond, but in a, in a way that's just, again, celebrates uh, and thanks all of you uh, for, for, for being here and for, for these fantastic responses. Um, let, let me work backwards uh, by saying, first of all, yes, I agree, uh, Santiago, with the idea that um, you know, the, the, the agents of colonialism are not just the state, uh, but it is interesting that debt uh, figures in, you know, in, in these histories in general uh, of uh, colonialism, but in this particular instance uh, of the idea that the, the way that, that this, these series of petit bourgeois, uh, but soi-disant uh, proletarian workers 
are saying, yeah, here we are, we're in the, we're in the Amazon, but we're doing it under cover of the, the sort of national imperative to colonize this particular part of the world. Uh, and I think that that's, that's interesting because, um, you know, in, in a lot of the discussions of frontiers, uh, na nationhood uh, doesn't turn up very much. Um, and understanding that frontiers are always accompanied by modes of governance, I think is, is a, a, a mission that, you know, it could be a friendly amendment to some of the stuff that, uh, that the frontiers folk are up to. But I, I think that there's, you know, what, what I'm trying to do here is mess with things just a little bit more in ways that are, uh, you know, helpful. Um, I'll, I'll get to how I'm going to mess with the idea of frontier in a second, but all, all of this is to say, yes, I agree. It's not merely the state that goes in, but it is the state that can, can provide a legitimating framework. So, so, certainly in this particular bit of Yanomami territory, uh, it appears that, that, that subnational, so, you know, the, the, uh, the, the state of Roraima is actually uh, providing material resources. Uh, and of course, although gold mining is illegal, if you look at the capital city in Roraima, you'll just see gold shop after gold shop after gold shop after gold shop. And that, that should be a, an indication that um, th there are certain ways in which that particular uh, state in Brazil is uh, very much invested in the idea of certain kinds of colonial incursion. Um, but, uh, you, you know, I mean, I, I, I also want to celebrate the, the, the idea that there are uh, th th this polarization between uh, sort of the, the the pure indigenous person and then the, the the sort of colonial campesino is not a helpful one. Um, I, I I don't. I mean, I'm uh, to be clear, I am not working with Yanomami communities. I, I I come to this story not from the Yanomami side, but from the Silicon Valley side. Uh, and if we're you know, what's interesting about the, the Yanomami territory story uh, is that it is. Uh, acting in uh, sort of dialectical relation uh, with, if we're thinking about gut microbiomes, then this is uh, a way in which the the uh, the work in the gut microbiome and the work of the shit is being turned into uh, an object that can be traded, that, that can be researched and you know, be a, a zone for capital coming from Silicon Valley into uh, you know, the hands of anthropologists who will go and then steal shit and then bring it back. That is a, you know, a, a very, very specific line uh, between uh, you know, the, the capital in San Jose and uh, you know, the, the capital of Silicon Valley flowing through its, um, it, its institutions like Stanford, then down to uh, Yanomami territory and then back up again. Uh, but the reason that, uh, and so th this is all to say, uh, you know, the, the, this, the, the idea of this space as a frontier is rendered complex precisely through its very specific relationships with flows of capital from Silicon Valley, uh, interested in bio, you know, the biomedical innovation and work that is happening in indigenous communities. Uh, but it's also interesting to see the, the work of Wall Street's capital flowing in and trying to make money off the subterranean world of carbon. Um, and also interesting to, to think about, you know, again, uh, the, the, sort of the local politics of gold, uh, and the acquisition of gold, again, subterranean uh, gold, but uh, as part of a national project. And all of this is happening at the same time at the same uh, latitude and longitude. Um, and now the, the frontiers folk may say, well, look, these are three different commodities happening at three different places. And you know what, what we can do is add a depth measurement uh, to render these differently legible. Um, so Devjani, this is a way of saying, you know, of coming back to your uh, idea about, well, you know, how does the subterranean matter here? Um, and we could complicate it even further by saying, well, look, it's not just the subterranean and you know, the, the, it's not just the poop. Uh, it in fact is what, what, what we're interested in capitalizing and recognizing and naming as the potential mine uh, is uh, the gut and the way that it travels and the way that uh, you know, there is work happening in the, the, the embedded knowledge usually of women who are cooking uh, and it is the rich diet uh, and the rich stewardship of the land uh, that then is manifest in the gut microbiome and then is manifest in the poop uh, and then becomes the, the, the identifiable commodity. And all of a sudden, you're messing with the idea of front, you know, the, the idea of what constitutes the frontier and where it's located sufficiently for it to be a little less interesting as a as a you know, as a use as, as a term. And so this is a way of saying, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not sold on the idea of frontier. I I, I think that it's not, um, yeah. I mean, it's not. It's just it. it I'm not sure that it does the work that it needs to. Uh, and 
Uh, and so I, I, I'm not sold on it. Part of this intervention is a, an attempt to try and move beyond it because I'm, I'm, I, I don't find that work terribly helpful. Um, I, I mean, I, I think that it's important though. I mean, I, I think the, the work that it's trying to do is precisely to move away from land labor capital, right? That, uh, and that's why, Dejani, you, your invitation for a feminist reading here, I think is the right one. Because what we're really asking is the question, who's doing the work in these stories? Who's doing the work? And if we if we are allowed to use the word who, then we can talk about microbiomes, and we can talk about women's work, and we can talk about the household as as, uh, a, 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 as a place that is being mined. Now, th this becomes a much more interesting way of thinking about the countryside. Uh, I mean, in in the way that I was using it, so, you know, loosely but intentionally provocatively, was to understand countryside as hinterland. Right, as a place in which you go to find folk, folk doing work that hasn't yet been uh, observed, uh, that hasn't yet been captured. So that's why the story of um, uh, opioid addict, uh, addicts in recovery can be understood as a countryside, right? Here, here's a place that previously hadn't been identified as a place that could be put to work. Uh, and that place was the opioid recovery center. Uh, and yet here we are, chicken executives in their infinite genius create this uh, you know, uh, recovery to chicken nugget pipeline um, as a way of you know, creating this hinterland, as a zone in which new work could be captured. Similarly, you know, to understand the household as the countryside, I, I think is, you know, it's provocative. It does in, immense violence to the idea of countryside as well it should. I mean, again, the, the idea of the countryside is at some level, requ you know, it requires the specificity, Christian and Neil, that you were talking about. Um, but it's not as if the ideas of uh, subterranean, uh, you know, a, a subterranean countryside in uh, Yanomami territory should be at all alien to folk in Europe. I mean, you know, if, if the, you know, the, the idea, for example, that the mafia uh, in and around Naples is uninterested in the land, in, in the countryside is, is false. I mean, you know, here's a way, uh, if, if you think of the way in which, uh, you know, uh, mafiosi waste disposal works. Um, it, it, what you're doing is finding land and then sub you know, in a subterranean way, uh, you're sticking uh, toxic waste underground, under farmland. Um, and and I, I find that quite interesting because you know the, the, the idea that, that the subterranean is a, a zone ripe for commodification isn't just a story about Yanomami territory. It's happening in Europe and it's happening right now. And it's happening under the most bucolic and beautiful countryside, which is simultaneously a tourist destination, which is simultaneously uh, a site for growing certain kinds of cereal. And it's simultaneously near uh, you know, olive oil, zones of olive oil production that are getting contaminated. Now, all of this is to say, the same latitude and longitude, even at different depths, can be part of a story of frontiers. But again, this isn't a story about place. It's really a story about work and identifying who is doing it and how that work can be captured and evaded uh, under capitalism. And I think that that's, that's what's interesting about this story of Yanomami territory and how it is that it ports back to our broader discussion of frontiers. Um, that's why I, you know, and this is to, to, to get then to, to the idea of Berger and Via Campesina. Uh, I mean, Berger is right in uh, identifying uh, ways that peasant life uh, you know, has identified, but also celebrates and creates moments of work and of leisure uh, that are resistant to commodification and capitalism. Um, and uh, you know, my my great honor has, has been occasionally to sort of step in to do some work for comrades associated with La Via Campesina. Uh, and that's how uh, it's been very interesting to see some of the, the, the frictions that you, uh, you, you've identified uh, between indigenous communities and uh, indigenous ways of understanding and peasant ways of understanding. But then you have things like the mystica, which in a sense, is what is happening here in Texas, right? The, the uh, Texas, the state that fought for slavery twice, uh, was so effective at destroying uh, indigenous communities' knowledge that in, in some places, uh, that knowledge exists as, uh, uh, as rumor and as metaphor. Um, and in, in Texas, for instance, we have uh, something called the Native American church, uh, the symbol for which is a teepee. Now, uh, Actually, first of all, the word church is a bit dodgy if you're, uh, you know, if, if you're uh, uh, want to be sort of truly maintain a fidelity to certain kinds of indigenous tradition uh, in 
you know, in, in this part of the world. Uh, and the TP doesn't belong to any of the indigenous traditions here, but it is part of uh, a revival and a reinvention of certain kinds of language and protocols uh, that looks very similar to what the, the La Via Campesina is doing. Uh, and I, I bring that up because if we're thinking about, well, what language can we use that moves, moves us beyond capitalism, that, that allows us to engage in a certain kind of understanding and naming of who, when, uh, and uh, with whom, when, uh, and where is the capital scene, then the, I think certain languages of revival uh, and certain languages of, of uh, revivalism around peasant knowledge and indigenous knowledge are going to be the ones we need uh, because they not only identify new kinds of relationship and relationships that have been suppressed, but also help us recognize where work is happening and how it is that we need to pay recognition and be pay to, to honor certain kinds of work that currently under capitalism necessarily can't be seen. So maybe that's a, a, a place to stop, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that I managed to answer at least a couple of the questions. Sure. Um... I think it was uh, it was uh, uh, very clear and somehow got us to to that uh, interesting point. Um, uh, certain kind of uh, revivalism, <laughs> certain kinds of uh, uh, the kind of a new new kind of uh, mystery, the, the the kind of the the making of the outside, even when is it when when it's not there and so on. And I I think we we are. Um, you know, um, I mean, looking uh, these days also at uh, at the kind of terrifying events on the on the political scene, and you know, one one cannot but sort of uh, 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 you know draw draw lines between this sort of uh, let's say nationalist uh, <laughs> obsessions and uh, and um, uh, sort of uh, you know uh, revivals of of certain uh, kind of. Uh, 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 national myths and how how let's say the idea of the countryside uh, is is part of all that you know so the, so indeed it's a, it's a kind of a very very uh, tricky uh, um, uh, field to 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 navigate uh, there I'm I'm looking at uh, at uh, at the chat box Nitin came with the, with a very nice uh, note uh what you what you say a word about it Nitin? well just i mean it, it's quite self-explanatory um just like i mean it, it just sort of um i mean the whole evocation of uh the yanomami uh shit becoming a medication sort of evoked uh, the entire thesis of vinegar on waste value and capital tried and um, I was just trying to link it uh, with uh, what De Depiani and uh, Christian and Neil said earlier. Um, no, but uh, but I really uh, enjoyed uh, the conversation around also upsetting the, the sort of whole uh, notion of the countryside. Um, but uh, I just I don't want to take uh, the space up because uh, I'm one of the organizers. But uh, perhaps uh, we have uh, I think another uh, we have time for another question. If anyone ha has a question rather than a remark, or if Raji, you have something to say, or oh, Hans, 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 you. Uh, you. Um, I was thinking, what can I add? I mean, to this firework, it's really fantastic. And as you are writing your notes and you mentioned, I think it's similar to me. I'm looking at palm oil plantations in Malaysia and the way of operationalization, how these uh, landscapes are drawn into kind of global economy. And I think it's very interesting because it resonates with a lot of uh, things that have been discussed because it's exactly not the frontier of palm oil plantation, which is somewhere else. It's old land that has been rubber plantations before and changing constantly um, and also being uh, built up even. So the, I was thinking on um, what type of, I mean, how to complicate what we are discussing right now more or how to, how to <laughs> think. And, I was wondering about political economies, uh, ecology's contribution, and the question of uh, of which types of capitalism are discussed here. Thinking about different uh, types of work, for example, uh, um, uh, po political geology, but also, and I think this is linking to um, uh, Debachani's um, uh, comment on the subterranean. Um, 
and also the work that has been done in political ecology on the complication between the indigenous communi communities, the resettled, sometimes resettled communities, um, um, nature protection, and so on and so forth. Um, but also then recently on work, for example, by Tanya Lee, recent book on um, um, a corporate um, uh, plantation life, corporate uh, um, occupation in the countryside. And uh, her description of uh, capitalism from below and capitalism from above. So on one hand, the kind of corporate um, regimes which fit to my kind of understanding of operationalization, but on the other hand, this kind of drawing of indigenous communities or the shit in what you discussed before into capitalist relations and the kind of re rendering resourceness to things. And, and I think there is also this kind of the, 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 the work that is done on Kat, Katya Yusuf, for example, on the subterranean is very kind of interesting because it's kind of trying to, to trouble also the understanding of, of how capitalism is transformed constantly and, and, and how it kind of uh, yeah, draws these relations constantly and new works with kind of less with economies of scale, but more with an inventorization and this I'm drawing again to my uh, understanding of the, of, for example, the palm oil plantation companies that turned from being palm oil producers to into urban developers, because suddenly palm oil plantations are on the edge of uh, cities and become a totally different asset and make it suddenly profitable to change. So there is a whole kind of, I think, a different, a different there are different modes uh, of appropriation that are also interesting to to keep in mind and to understand uh, the specificity that that Christian mentioned, and I think this is also again speaks so much to my work how the that it's not that kind of a one story that can be told, and and it's so crucial to maintain different narratives. I think Thank you. It's more a comment than a. No, no, no. It, uh, but but you you're inspiring me to think. Well, you know, what. Uh, in, in thinking about the frontier, one of the important other notions that we've not really spent enough time on here, uh, but which all, all of you have, have in, in some way you know, pointed me towards is the idea of crisis, right? If, if debt is one of the, the, uh, the vectors for colonial, uh, you know, of, 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 sort of capitalism from below, uh, the other and the, the, the sort of broader story of the idea of the frontier is that it is a fix, a spatial fix for crisis. And again, that, that's another way of thinking about the, 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 the Siyanomami story, because it's a, it's a fix to three different kinds of crises. Uh, one of the inde indebtedness of the, the petit bourgeois, Gahim Peos, uh, one uh, around the climate crisis, right? That the, the, the subterranean carbon sequestration is precisely a way of fixing and allowing to continue uh, fossil fuel extraction and its consequences. And the third thing is that we're, we're fixing through Yanomami shit, uh, the consequences of the, you know, the spread in particular in urban, the, the urban United States of certain kinds of uh, annihilation of life that then result in uh, uh, certain kinds of gastrointestinal disease. You know, this is what we're talking about in in, uh, in the, the inflamed book. Uh, is how the the sort of spatial uh, rupture between you know, what, what it is that capitalism has done to our bodies and, uh, in particular, in cities uh, in the global north. You know, what what has happened to our, our microbiomes gets to get a, gets to be fixed through the frontier of Yanomami shit. Uh, and that crisis uh, is a biomedical one, but it's also uh, you know, a, a crisis within the healthcare system. Uh, and it is part of the, 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 the sort of broader crisis of the sixth extinction. Uh, now, I, I, I want to raise all of that because it again helps us come to a different and, and richer understanding of the dialectic between countryside and city, rather than think of it as zone of extraction or a hinterland, but you know, understand it as space of fix uh, and a space in which work is being sought uh, and simultaneously a, a, a space in which in order to be recognized, other kinds of narratives and modes of recognition and being need to be annihilated. Uh, and that's why nationalism is so important in this story. And uh, again, this is a way of saying frontiers always happen under cover of nationhood, which Hans, you know, I mean, you know, it, it, thinking about your palm oil plantations, uh, it, it sounds to me like that they are very much part of the national development project and rehabilitation of certain kinds of land as part of a national moment of, of development. Um, and I think that that's, 
you know, I'm, I'm just so grateful to this conversation for having brought all of those things together. And the thing that I'm still wrestling with is the, the idea of reproductive labor and of the feminist reading here of the countryside, which Debjani, you're, you're again, you're, you, you've pointed towards the idea of the household as, uh, as a countryside in a useful way. Now I can narrate to some extent, again, you know, when I was talking about Yanomami shit, it's women's knowledge that is often embedded in that, right? Um, but I wonder if there's a richer way of engaging with the, the feminist politics of uh, of, of subverting the idea of the frontier. I don't know, Debra, do, do, do you, I, I, I'd very, be very grateful if you, if, if you can fix my problem for me. <laughs> I, do, if you can, I don't know about that, no, but I, I do think like when you were giving the talk, I thought there was something very, very provocative about the way you theorize the household, which is so different in some ways from the way people like how household has been theorized by putting it in relation to a question of frontier and territory. And I think with the biome thing, there is you are really opening up something. But I will now add something to the mix, which has nothing to do with the what we you, like, which has everything to do with your talk, but not with the feminist uh, rethinking of the frontier. And that has to do with what is the nation state here? Why are we thinking we know what the nation state is? Because you completely ruptured any idea through your theorization of the nation state, although it's a part of a national project, when Yamamami becomes one vec like one way to sort of illuminate uh, the question of global capitalism, we, where, which is through the biome that draws the Silicon Valley, through the carbon sequest sequestration draws Wall Street, what exactly is the nation state here? And that's a question I think also that we should not take for granted because there is, it's so rich what you're doing with this space. So anyways, I'll just leave it there. I haven't answered your question, but if if I, I I'll think about it and I'll come back to you maybe in an email. I mean, I would uh, perhaps return to to Christian and to Neil when it comes to what is the nation state. <laughs> we have the people on the table to answer. <laughs> I don't know which one would like to take it. Well, I mean, the point is that um, I, I mean that leads now to to an, an, a complete other field. Um, uh, but I mean, um, of course, looking on Lefebvre's um, approach to the state, um, it's interesting to see that that he developed that that idea of a, of a state space. Um, and that means that space as such um, is a kind of instrument for the state. And I think what you what you described here is exactly such a process that somehow um, the state that that even 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 if these are now the, I think it's a, it's a great example. I mean, even if um, campesinos are the actors here, um, but but how they somehow um nevertheless um well proceed with a state project um i think that that's for me this is an is, is a very 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 amazing um understanding because in in doing in doing our research on on what we call extended urbanization so exactly the transformation of these countrysides into um in, into in, into very very different landscapes if you look on the drivers um in most of the cases we looked at um and that 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 goes from from the I mean, actually, from 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 Garajas in 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 Amazon in, in Brazil in Amazonia, um, up to uh, let's let's say um, the Pearl River Delta, uh, and, and and a lot of other examples in between, um, that that this kind of um, extended urbanization is strongly related to 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 state state strategies, and 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 is only possible through um, this kind of um, generalizing force that that this kind of state space can um, somehow assert. And the point here is 
that again, the state is then not sold as a container and the state is not sold as just, um, let's say, a top-down thing with a, with a government that does all sorts of strategies. But if you want to understand that, uh, you have to, to go in all the details. And it's also, of course, a local state plays a role and local elites and regional elites and so on. They all, they all play their role in that game. And, and, and I think it, for me, it's really imaginative to think about, yes, the campesinos are part also of these kind of strategies and suddenly follow these strategies. And for us, I think this is an eminently political question here, of course, the state, but also if we think about how can we address these kind of really, really devastating um, developments. I mean, what you described. Uh, um, I, I, I mean, I mean that that um, I, I mean, Raj. I mean that that's really. Um, I, mean, I mean, these are horrifying processes. No, these are terrible processes. And if you look on on, on similar on similar territories um, in of extended urbanization, then then we. I mean, I mean, I'm constantly shocked through the brutality and the pure force that is that is that is applied here um to to i mean to people and 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 and, and nature and, and everything and and i think here um i mean particularly if you look to the future i think so so we can long debate about climate change and 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 and, and world conferences and things like that i mean uh, but on the ground there is something else that goes on and this is are exactly these processes. And 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 you look you look now from the from the from the from the perspective of um, uh, of of the capitalization um, of of, um, uh, of 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 nature and 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 of this of these kind of resources. And we look more through through the lens of, of urbanization processes. But but it is of course completely related. It is at the end of the day, it's the same processes. So I, I think and here to find answers. Is, is a key question. And, and I think we are still much too much looking at um, what we call concentrated urbanization. So on the big metropolises, on the big cities, and, and that's that's the discourse that is dominant here. So if we want to provide, if, if, we, if we want to change something in climate change, we have to be in Paris or in New York or, or, or maybe in Singapore. <laughs> I mean, I, I know Singapore, so that, that would be hopeless. But anyway, um, but but the point here is no, <laughs> no, that's that's precisely somehow the wrong way looking at it because then the, all these processes they just they just stay below the radar and there is the, the devastate these are the devastating processes and not not our luxury uh, enclaves uh, in the in 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 the centers of the metropolises okay i stop here <laughs> thanks very much um um uh, if uh, there is perhaps another uh, another uh, another question another idea another another insight on the table um i um i think uh, somehow i i'm uh, in a in a quite uh, kind of a, you know uh, inspired uh, mode and uh, will continue to to probably write down some notes and ideas for the hours to come and uh, we'll have a recording soon oh neil neil okay neil hello i uh, can see your hand i realize that we're out of time yeah but i just wanted to of. say what one other thing aside from just appreciation to raj for incredibly inspiring and to you know just work and for this presentation and to the, the to everyone for the conversation but just for the the students in the room like coming a lot of you i think from the design the design world like this may be self-evident but i just think it always needs to be repeated like the categories that are used to map and understand and shape the world are so fundamentally corrupted by ideologies that obfuscate all the stuff that that Raj and other critical theorists of capitalism and power and injustice are trying to illuminate. And, and this is, of course, why theory is essential, why critical theory is essential. I mean, again, it's obvious, I think, given that you're in a group with, you know, Milica and Christian and, and Nitin, like this is obvious, but it still needs to be repeated. Like this is why the theories are so important. The state itself 
systematically obfuscates through its own hegemonic naturalized categories for mapping the world and our relation to it, the underlying processes of exploitation and environmental degradation and obliteration that constitute life and death right now. And it's just, you know, a conversation like this, I mean, I'm just basically picking up the baton from where Christian left off. Like the urgency of conversations like this is to critically interrogate and deconstruct the categories. And also as we develop new categories, and again, Raj and Jason and other colleagues working in this field are just, you know, like leading the way in terms of opening up new categories for illuminating just all of the um, social suffering, suffering and environmental destruction and, and also the possibilities for something else, which are also obfuscated by dominant ideologies. So this is important in social science. It's important in design. And as designers, for those of you who are, you know, lots of people in the room are designers, like just getting clear about your categories. Yeah. Avoiding I mean, you... using the, the categories <laughs> that, are, that are so obfuscatory and coming up with new ones. Like that's, that's as essential to our work as any kind of, you know, fancy mapping program or anything else. Anyway, I just, I felt impelled. Of course, to, of course. Kind of I, I, just, I just want to want to bring it out fully. Are you, are you arguing to, for, for kind of abandoning fully the term countryside or, or, uh, you know, we have, we have discussed for many hours, you know, that, that, you know, urban rural divide, you know, to go fully beyond it, we have to abandon both of those terms, actually, you know, I mean, that, you know, where, where shall we go? I mean, we, we also need terms to, to work with, to, to allow us to unlock this kind of discussion. And, you know, there is a, I mean, a good thing about designers is that there is a kind of a, almost like a compulsory optimism, you know, that that is, <laughs> well, let's say part of any act of design. So, you know, we, we think always about redesigning everything, you know, terminology, institutions, processes, relationships, et cetera, et cetera. So, so whatever is on the table is never understood in, in a kind of, or at least I think the, the the effort is there to not understand anything as a kind of a permanent fixture or as a kind of a you know ultimate ideology and so on. I'm just uh, I'm just uh, curious where where you're heading, Neil. Maybe you wanna wanna share that. We need another symposium to uh, continue <laughs> okay. that conversation. I'll, I'll just say that um, you know many categories of social science are categories of practice and categories of analysis. That's an old distinction from Pierre Bourdieu, and it's quite useful in this context. So that also goes for the urban and the city. It's clearly a category of practice that's used in all kinds of ideological ways, and it's a category of analysis that you know, critical social scientists and, and others try to use. And the countryside is, is clearly both. Um, in any discussion of social science categories, if we're gonna use categories of analysis that also happen to have a role in categories of practice, we have to clarify what that relationship is. So I'm not saying that any category of practice is off limits because, because most categories of analysis also come from social struggle. <laughs> I mean, including in, in radical traditions, especially like all categories of all theory is the result of practice. <laughs> That's, a, that's the relationship. I mean, that's an old debate, of course, right. but, <laughs> but, but in this case, in the case of the countryside, I personally would argue that, um, that it's increasingly obfuscatory as a category of analysis. And the challenge then is to use categories of analysis to understand the changing role of the rural or the countryside in practice. In other words, it's not that we can ignore it because it's used in all kinds of you know, local and geopolitical struggles, the countryside, the rural. So we need, you know, so a parallel would be the, the debate on nationalism. So for a long time in nationalism studies, scholars of nationalism simply used the notion of the nation as a category of analysis, even though it was also a category of practice. And at some, at some point, I mean, Benedict Anderson was key in that discussion. Um, there was a, a question of, well, it's it's clearly a category of practice, but maybe we need other categories of analysis in order to understand its vicissitudes and its constant reinvention as a category of practice. And my my good friend and former classmate from many years ago, Manu Goswami, wrote a brilliant book, The Production of India, which is basically about that problem, where she, you know, 
She's interested in the production of India as a category of practice in relation to all kinds of spatial territorial transformations of South Asia in the context of colonialism and anti-colonial nationalism. But she argues for a very Lefebvrean actually analysis of um, the production of space in India, you know, post so-called mutiny India, you know, from the 19th century forward through which to understand the vicissitudes of that particular category of practice. And I would say something similar for the countryside. We shouldn't reify it as a category of practice. It also means something different now in let's say, if it's used, let's say in contemporary Brazil than it did in, you know, 19th century anti-colonial struggles in South Asia. A lot more could be said, but I, I should sure, stop. Very, very, very clear and, um... I think uh, very, very important for the students. A lot of PhDs are here. We, we continue working on these things. And it's, uh, it's actually a very, very good, uh, I think, atmosphere in the, in the doctoral school. So I kind of use the opportunity to advertise it when we have these, uh, these uh, interesting people on the table. So uh, uh, if, you, if you agree, I mean, I just, uh, uh, from my side, a very uh, warm thank you to everybody and what an honor to have uh, this kind of a fabulous <laughs> start <laughs> and, uh, and the exciting exchange and um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep in touch. Thank you so much, uh, everyone, for being here. <laughs> thank you, Raj, for a great talk. Thank you, Diviani. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Neil, for a uh, for, uh, a kind of a special uh, guest uh, appearance <laughs> unannounced great to see you and uh, thank you to the to the students thanks uh, guys for uh, for a great start of the of these round of the sessions on territory uh, ciao have a good have a good evening or uh, <laughs> all the best thanks thanks